ready the recruits. We're moving a little earlier than expected. I thought maybe we'd have slowed him down a little easier with that fool at his farm, but I suppose I underestimated our friend on the horse. Anyway, no matter. Prepare the train and make sure everyone is up to speed with our little change of plans. We move to Iowa. The air had a strangely unsettling weight to it that had refused to shift for days. Perhaps it was the cuts and bruises that provided a lingering reminder of the battles recently fought. Or maybe it was the exhaustion that constantly reassured that the war was far from over. Regardless of the cause, the shoulders of everyone at the camp began to buckle under a pressure that would be a great challenge to alleviate. Not everyone could bounce back as fresh and efficient as the gifted few. Not everyone could heal wounds in seconds, feel rejuvenated after a wink of sleep, no. This war was beginning to tire. It had far past the point of simply walking away, simply allowing the West to be swallowed whole by evil on an empty stomach. But there was no ignoring the facts. People were tired, still hopeful, but tired. Victories were difficult to celebrate when it was obvious that the next hurdle was merely around the corner. It was understandable, at the very least, to be on the verge of giving up. But for some, this desperation only bred motivation, only created determination to finish on the right side of what was started. The war was now six months deep, and only now were the boys beginning to understand the true figureheads in control. Leviticus Cornwall. Rich, powerful, undoubtedly influential, but the extent to which the boys had underestimated his control was unprecedented. Mere weeks had passed since Micah had regrouped with Western Jesus, Frank, and the rest of the resistance. They couldn't remember the last time they'd stopped to catch a breath, but they were onto something big. The hard work was about to pay off, and with the plan well and truly in motion, a proper stride to put a stick in the spokes of Cornwall's plans could finally be made. If you're a little confused, uh, don't worry, the war became sporadic, full of revelations, majorly kicked into overdrive very quickly. So allow me to fill you in. It all started with a single discovery, just days after our heroes reunited with one Micah Bitchslap Bell. A fellow member of the Resistance, who had long been recovering from wolf-related injuries, had been secretly using his downtime wisely. John felt that his assistance to the team had been lazy and overall quite lackluster, and while he hadn't been fit for combat for quite some time, he'd organized a string of solo covert missions in hopes he could provide at least some sort of help to the cause. While progress started off slow and information seemed about as scarce as a flannelette wearing man hiding behind a tree, John eventually hit the recon jackpot. After befriending a group of travelers just minutes after arriving in Valentine, John made a very important discovery. An influx of new faces had come pouring out of the trains in Valentine. What used to be a grim few every couple of days had turned into nothing short of a hundred visitors, all bright-eyed and smiling. John kept watch for a while before engaging, but was quick to charm his way into one of the smaller groups, who headed directly for the saloon to celebrate. What exactly were they celebrating? John was eager to find out. Sure, the lead could have been a complete dead end, but he was out looking for something unusual, and there wasn't much out there more unusual than seeing hundreds of men and women cheerfully visiting the city of mud. They're here on a job, he told Arthur. And look, I know you've had your suspicions, I know you've had your visions, but this one pretty much confirms it. Arthur's eyes widened slightly as John elaborated. He began detailing the intel he recovered from the mysterious travelers. They were here on a job for Leviticus Cornwall. They were being paid double what they'd make in a year, and apparently all they had to do was play dress up and meet somewhere here. 
John pointed to a railway station somewhere north of Valentine, a somewhat secluded station out in the sticks. The boys, of course, had no idea exactly what the relevance of this intel held, but if it was tied to Leviticus, it was worth chasing down. They needed to stop that train before it reached its destination, before Leviticus could subject even more sorry souls to work under his regime. And apparently, John knew exactly how they could do it. Frank and Arthur raced for the local refinery, their thoughts moving faster than the legs that carried them. The refinery, which was owned under the Cornwall name, was another point of interest revealed to John by the travellers. Maybe the goal was to ride the travellers in to different outposts? To assign them different jobs? Different roles? Was Cornwall trying to build an army? Our boys didn't know for sure, but it would make sense. Maybe Cornwall had more people on his side than what they'd realised. Semantics aside, stopping that train was the primary objective, and the first step in doing so would be acquiring a barricade threatening enough to stop it. Although the refinery was heavily guarded, stealing the oil tank was a pretty straightforward objective. Drink a tonic, jump the fence, steal the wagon right away. It was a simple four-step plan. Drink a tonic, jump the fence, steal the wagon, get shot to pieces, narrowly miss the innocent puppy, accidentally knock a guard into the dirt, get shot some more, fucking explode. The second attempt went a little smoother as I was on the wagon and out the gate before the guards had a chance to ignite the wagon. A much better result. The best part of rising tensions. The best part of impending doom. The best part of high stakes was the sense of togetherness that had spread throughout the resistance. More and more people were rushing to join the cause, eager to contribute in whatever way they could. Arthur and Frank were somewhat strangers to this level of help, and with Mykaroff dealing with the loose ends of Strawberry security, things had definitely been tough. But the sudden initiative taken by so many members of the group was deeply appreciated. Sean still got on Frank's nerves, almost to the point of an accidental spine breakage, but he too had his heart embedded in this mission, and seeing the West crumble would break him all the same. Darkness swallowed the meeting point as the team assembled. West and Jesus on lead, Frank on rear lookout, Sean on carriage scout, Charles and John on crowd control. Regardless of the current moral standing of Cornwall's passengers, they certainly wouldn't be open to having the paycheck of a lifetime stripped away from them. A small team for a big job, but if this could be executed quietly and efficiently, the five of them would be more than enough to get things under control and figure out exactly what to do next. What's going on here? What's going on? As Charles wrapped his shotgun around the train driver's head, I was reminded that soon, I would probably have to perform a very similar act of violence. Don't know why this knockout stood out to me so much, but I remembered it clearly. That door, right there, led to whipping someone in the face with a rifle, and it was a knockout I really wasn't looking forward to. It was the worst kind of knockout. A forced knockout. The kind that doesn't budge. The kind that you can't get out of. The kind that locks you into an animation and makes the decision for you. I like it, Kaji. However, we all know by now that when it comes to TGB, I am the perfect combination of stubbornness and fucking stupidity. So despite the fact that this was clearly an unskippable animation, I got to trying every possible strategy to bypass it anyway. After getting stuck in a checkpoint loop that forced me to knock the man out over and over again, I restarted the mission from scratch. My immediate thought here was to try and enter the carriage through the back door rather than the front, hopefully to skip the animation by simply approaching from another direction. Unfortunately, Rockstar made sure to lock every other carriage door on the train, pushing me right along to my next approach. And hey, just to encourage me even more to throw myself off a cliff, Rockstar slapped a juicy time limit on the mission too, giving me only about two to three minutes before I'd be forced to restart. As usual, there were a lot of minor strategies I tested, all of which ended up being futile. But there was one that I dug into with way too much faith. Animations are unskippable. Pretty much full stop, at least so far. Why I dedicated so much time to finding a way to get Arthur's rifle out of his hands and onto his back is kind of beyond me at this point. But regardless, I found a way to do it. My thinking here was that maybe, maybe, if I didn't have the rifle in my hands when triggering the animation, 
some sort of holy miracle could occur, allowing me to skip the knockout completely. But let me tell you, okay? After the disgusting amount of time that it took to get this glitch working properly, teeth from that man's face still fucking flew. The gun magically pops into Arthur's hands as soon as the carriage is entered. I was almost gonna leave this out of the video completely, because the strategies involved with trying to bypass this knockout were pretty baseless. I only really decided to leave them in because even I myself am surprised that I spent an hour and a half trying to unequip a fucking weapon. Help me. Knockouts are always hard to swallow, especially when it's a rifle being jammed down somebody's throat. But I was happy to move past this one as long as I wouldn't be forced to take out any more passengers. They might have been on their way to work for Cornwall, but it was obvious to Arthur that they had no idea of the disaster assisting him could bring. They were still people, regardless of what side of the battle they were acting on. As I made my way through the carriages, I was happy to discover that Rockstar allowed Arthur to continue holding onto the sentiment. Although the game strongly encouraged me to crack every single non-compliant passenger over the head, I didn't have to. If I waited just a couple of extra seconds, John would happily carry this out for me. This was off to an okay-ish start, but as usual, this was merely the calm before the storm, the deep breath before the plunge, the ad before the video. It should really come as no surprise that I was in for something fucked up. The next phase of this mission was about to begin, and as Sean scouted the carriages, I was reminded of yet another reason why I was terrified of this mission. Something in here, Arthur. Forced Deadeye. Thankfully, seriously, thank Christ that I could put away the rifle and re-equip my lasso here. Sean was swiftly killed in the encounter, gone, dead, but at least I knew that there was hope for this section at all. Regardless of the challenge that I was surely about to face, this was kind of the perfect position to be in, in terms of mission completion that is. I had a comfortable checkpoint to try again from, and I had enough freedom here to exercise the strategies that I wanted to. The boys expected at least some kind of pushback when stopping the train. That's why they had a carriage scout in the first place. As soon as these guards were taken care of, a friendly interrogation was in order. Where exactly was this train off to? First strategy, of course, was to break out of the rifle Deadeye, equip my lasso, and save Sean from getting murdered. Pretty sure I've said this before, but tight maneuvering in Red Dead 2 is not at all what the game was designed for. Trying to run into the carriage and tie these guys up before they could kill Sean was quite the nightmare. Anyway, I spent longer than I expected I would on this small section, either failing because the enemies overwhelmed me or failing because of Sean's death by time limit. Although, eventually, I discovered an order to lassoing the enemies that allowed Sean to recover from the head bonking and blast every guard on the train into the afterlife. The tension lessened, and yet another lull had set in. As Arthur searched the carriages for any sign of where the train had been, where it was headed, anything. Unfortunately, in terms of useful intel, the carriage was empty. Nothing but personal items belonging to the workers on board. However, what the storage carriage lacked in useful information could almost definitely be made up for after a word with the passengers. That had become priority number one. At least it was, until Sean spotted an ominous glow approaching through the trees. Uh, in that case, we're fighting. Hush, Smith, get ready. You men come out the train now, do you hear? We said you men come out now. There's only two of you, you fools. We got a whole lot less to lose. That was a bluff, and every last one of the boys knew it. The entire mission was at stake now. They couldn't afford to leave without at least some useful information. Arthur called out for Frank to secure the intel, to interrogate the passengers and find out what they know. They had to fight this one out just long enough to gather what they needed. This was very clearly an ambush. And had the team had longer to prepare, perhaps whatever oversight caused them to fall into such a trap could have been avoided. But it wasn't. They were still playing catch-up, just like Cornwall wanted. 
Going into this mission was a bit of a roller coaster in terms of my planning. Definitely a weird one to approach. But let's get the obvious things out of the way first. The enemies were absolutely capable of gunning down John, Sean, and Charles given enough time. While this is common, it's worth mentioning here in particular because their deaths can be majorly fast-tracked by something I want to discuss later. The boys being killed was the source of most failures. Sounds morbid, because it is. This is one of my least favourite situations to be in with these attempts, trying over and over and over again to explore new possibilities only to be sent back to the drawing board every 10 seconds because one of the boys gets their spleen removed on the battlefield. <laughs> At first, I avoided going in recklessly. I tested the boundaries a little, dipped my toes in the water, but it was useless. I knew just from the positioning of this mission that Rockstar was going to heavily rely on me staying on that carriage and firing at the enemies in front. The only problem was, of course, that I was trying to do the exact opposite. So this was a bit of a shit show. There weren't an overwhelming amount of enemies in comparison to some of the situations our heroes have faced, but this felt particularly chaotic. A combination of the unpredictable time limit, the pressure by design to play this out in a very specific way, that fucking battle music booming in the background. Anyway, if I was going to get a real sense for how this mission worked, I was going to have to get really comfortable with jumping into the fray. I noticed very quickly, however, that I had gone into this mission somewhat ill-equipped. I was dying very quickly due to the lack of cover on the battlefield, and if I was going to last long enough to really test the limitations of this area, I needed the necessary supplements to hold me through. Which is why I'm proud to announce that this video is sponsored by G Fuel. When Western Jesus is feeling down, he thanks Cowboy Christ that G Fuel's around. This video nor the Isaiah channel is sponsored or endorsed by G Fuel. So I exited the mission, rode with Frank all the way to Valentine, got stocked to the hilt with beans, corn, health potions, miracle tonics, the works. The utility belt was full, the, the beans were spilling out of it, and I was ready to tackle this intense combat situation head on. I did have to start from the very beginning of the mission to return to where I was, but it was pretty easily done since I'd already figured out the formula to it. So we were back pretty much in the same position before, just loaded with the items necessary to see things through. Now, my first attempt back was very telling of the problems to come. I don't need to hype up that there was a major issue anymore, right? Like, I, I feel like you guys know by now exactly the dread that these missions bring. This looks like a pretty regular death. A chaotic one, sure, but nothing out of the ordinary. But here, inside this attempt, was the root of the issue. An issue that I actually wouldn't discover was the problem for a very, very long time. The lasso has definitely made me too cocky over time, and although I have had experience where it hasn't been the direct solution, I pretty much start off every single attempt by trying to simply restrain the enemy. It's always my beginning tactic wherever possible. I can't really count how many times I went with this approach, but if it was one thing that I learned quickly from the vile amount of tries, it's that 9 out of 10 times, the mission would not fail because I died trying to tie the enemies up but rather because the enemies would kill either Charles, Sean, or John. It was frustrating too, because it was possible to complete the hog tying process with these enemies. They didn't break out like we've seen in previous missions or anything like that. But every single time I got to restraining one, one of the boys were taken out. Not on like a date, I mean taken out as in taken out the back and put down. I tried pretty much every combination I could here, approaching a different enemy first each time, pretending to be active on the train and then rushing down after a minute or so, all of which ended in a mission failure. And although my eventual discoveries here did lead me to technically the wrong conclusion, it was a relatively similar path to what I needed. There were a lot of misconceptions here from me. I thought that restraining any of the enemies was the root cause of the failures. And while it might have been a cause, it definitely wasn't the cause. It took me quite an embarrassing amount of time to figure this out for certain, because I was testing under the impression that the failures were being caused by strictly the restraints. But after a while, I unintentionally discovered that it had a lot more to do with my positioning. Let me explain for you. After realizing the restraints were absolutely not the way to go, I moved on to working on disarms. The plan here was to disarm and lead the enemy to Charles, either to be killed or to cause a BS PTSD kind of reaction. Neither of those things happened, however, as the mission still failed. This was when I really started focusing on testing the actual location-based limitations. Where can I take this battle? 
exactly how far can I go in each direction before I'm forced into failure. This was one of my more important discoveries for this mission. And even though location-based limitations are technically present in every mission of Red Dead 2, this was particularly important because of how strict the area of play was. A couple failures later and I had a pretty solid understanding of the play area, along with the new challenges that I'd be faced with as a consequence. With my main reason for failure established, along with the area I had to work with mapped out, I was ready to start creating strategies set within my new parameters. It took me a second to actually get this worked out, but basically, moving beyond this point was a complete no-no. That right there was the border to failure town. Cross it and somebody dies. Considering that all of the enemies here lived in Failure Town, the root of my problem was that I had been attacking them in their own territory. What I needed to do was bring them over to my side, take them on a snazzy little tour of Success City, really show them how stinky Failure Town was. I began doing this Scorpion style, mortal combating the shit out of these fellas, minus the grotesque murder and humiliation, of course. I started off by roping them in and then restraining them, in hopes that tying them up within my play area would negate the failures caused by this previously. Combinations of this strategy were tried until I was absolutely certain that enemy restraint equaled failure. It didn't really take long for this to become apparent, but I could feel that frustration rise as my single discovery had once again brought about 10 new problems into the mix. If I couldn't tie the enemies up, then how exactly would we move past this wave? I was kind of running out of things to try here, but I hadn't tested exactly what the limits were of how many the boys could kill yet, which is usually one of the first things that I try. But regardless, I was pretty sure the boys couldn't kill all of them. I did need to try though. This was pretty much my only option to move forward. It was enticing to rush down and restrain the lassoed enemies as soon as they hit the floor, because the closer I dragged them to Charles, Sean, and John, the more capable they were of shooting and killing them. But rather than panicking, I put my patience to the ultimate test and just began watching. I needed to see exactly what the boys were capable of and how many guards we'd have left over as a result. This was a strategy I've kind of neglected far too often. It really should be my go-to rather than diving into solutions right away. Just observing and learning how the enemies were scripted to attack, how the game wants you to take them out, and understanding that there were major inconsistencies all throughout this mission helped me more than anything to piece together a solid strategy here. I know that I am majorly oversimplifying here, and I still do struggle to find a way to pack all of my thinking and all of my reasons for trying certain things into a single video. But this mission has already been the most difficult to do that for. I'm gonna do my darndest here to explain the entirety of my journey, but it was a bit of a doozy. What made this section so tedious both to complete and to explain is both the inconsistencies and small intricacies it held. Sometimes I'd fail for tying someone up, sometimes I wouldn't. Sometimes the boys could take the enemies down to a final four, and sometimes all the way down to three. It was super unpredictable. Maybe not as unpredictable as some missions have been. Fuck that mission, by the way. It's just that certain mission failures were all over the place. It had me so frustrated at one point that I'd resorted to believing a Rockstar employee was just sitting in a room somewhere, flipping the switch that'd make me fail for different reasons. True delusion had just about settled in. But, as usual, there was an attempt that eventually changed everything. The right combination of restraints in the right place at the right time with the right amount of enemies handled by the boys triggered phase two of this nightmare. This part of the mission in particular took me an absolutely feral amount of time to figure out. Phase two was basically identical to phase one. The only difference was the specifics of what we'd learned before. Specifics as in the fail zones, where you could and couldn't restrain enemies, and how long before the mission decided you weren't being fast enough. My first introduction to phase two was a messy experience. I was so hesitant to try anything, 
because I was almost certain failure would set us back to phase one all over again. But at the same time, I knew I needed to at least try something, because inactivity triggers failures more consistently than anything else in this game. So while being fed more lead than a mechanical pencil, I stupidly rushed in, tried my luck at restraining one of the phase two enemies, and failed as a result. The absolute worst part of this was, I didn't fail because I died, it was because Sean did. Which basically confirmed to me that the fail zones here were just as strict as phase one. I'm probably leaving out hours of recordings here and other attempts that I really wanted to include as well, because things really fell off track after my introduction to phase two. It was insanely difficult for me to claw my way back to phase two, and after tons of failures with very few glimpses of what the next step was, I derailed my entire approach to the mission. That's a, uh... A little train joke for you. But let's skip to what was actually important. This seems to be very common in the episodes now. This return to the core strategy that was actually the recipe to progress all along. But this time, I really don't think I would have had the heart, the fucking willpower, to push through this chaotic attempt without building up my brain calluses with all those useless attempts first. Because, see, my eventual return to the core strategy was all out war. After all my failed attempts, from the moment I began this mission to the attempt you're seeing now, I had the process of my strategies down to a science. What you're seeing here is a weathered man. No, not that kind, that kind carefully calculating the necessary moves to abandon this hellscape. All that was required was a little bit of luck and a whole lot of persistence. Rarely was this the case, but Charles actually killed this first enemy rather than him needing to be restrained. The second and third closest enemies occupying the front lines met the same fate, but that was when the rarest of all occurrences became a reality. I'd only seen this happen a handful of times before in all of these attempts, an inconsistency that I hadn't successfully taken advantage of yet. An additional enemy taking cover behind the trees was pistol sniped by John, triggering the sweet, supple sound of phase two dialogue. Keeping in mind that my experience with phase two was extremely limited, with only two or three real tries with it so far, I was still a little bit out of my depth. But one thing I did have going for me was that I did know what hadn't worked so far. So basically, in a scramble to take advantage of these extremely rare occurrences, my only strategy here was to continue testing the waters, but this time, by diving in head first. Managing both sides of the carriage was one of the most difficult balancing acts I have ever had to perform in TGB. But one thing that gave me the edge here is that as long as Arthur stayed within the play areas and out of the fail zones, the rest of the boys were extremely competent. They weren't gifted like Frank, they weren't experienced like Micah, but they had heart. And their dedication to this mission shined through like nothing Western Jesus had ever seen. They were finally working together as a team. I bounced between both sides of the carriage, roping in leftover enemies from Phase 1 and bringing them close enough for Charles to finish the job. When finally all the Phase 1 troopers had been overwhelmed, it was time to find a way to end phase two and initiate the completely uncharted phase three. The rest of the enemies were positioned much too far for me to lasso them. Too far into the fail zones for me to even consider approaching actually. But it didn't matter, as John once again proved his fast improving marksmanship and completely obliterated the last three enemies with his trademark pistol snipes. I couldn't believe that things had gone so smooth despite the chaos, but at the same time, I also wasn't completely surprised that this eventually worked. The strategies were there, and they held promise. This really just became a test of waiting long enough for them to be applied properly. We were given a window with those rare occurrences finally coming together. It was just a matter of working quick enough to take advantage of them. With nothing left to hold us back, it was time to leave before the inevitable reinforcements arrived. Frank darted across the hills just in time, quickly informing the boys that he'd collected enough information from the passengers along with a little something else. Arthur, Frank, Sean, Charles and John dashed away under the cover of darkness, 
only the moon's light bearing witness to their escape. Well, that and a couple of extra enemies along the way, but that sounds a lot less cool. Eventually, the group put enough distance between them and their pursuers. The battle was over. That grueling effort had finally come to a close, and the only thing on everyone's minds now was the hope that the entire ordeal had been worth it. As the boys began discussing intel and organizing a plan to split and lie low, Frank spoke up with an announcement. I got some information back there. Quite a lot, actually. But I'm not sure you're gonna like it. He has a hand in a lot more baskets than what we thought. A lot more. Things have been difficult along the way, it was always obvious that something or someone was at the heart of it. And we've done our best to stop it. We have. But at the same time, I'm also afraid we might have made things worse. I'm afraid that our presence, our determination to push back, might have turned his sights onto something more sinister. Arthur was nodding like he understood. He was, but as Frank continued explaining his intel, things only got more confusing. We have to move, Arthur. Somewhere else. He'll find us again, sure, but it'll buy us some time. We cannot confront him. Not yet. That is something we need to be properly prepared for. Just this one last job, and we're out. I'd leave it be, but it wouldn't be right. One last thing, Arthur, and we're gone. Somewhere we can regroup. Somewhere we can prepare. Arthur was taken aback by the seriousness of Frank's tone. He often joked about harsh situations, provided some sort of comedic relief, but the information he learned definitely had him on his toes. Well, if he had any, that is. But Arthur too understood his concern. Cornwall was doing more than trying to bribe and trick hardworking people to get on his side, and the horse bonding was just the start of it. Frank's intel from the train passengers, along with a quick trip to one of the farms in the area to corroborate, confirmed that he'd set his sights on something more ambitious. No doubt inspired by the tales of a man and his telekinetic horse, whose power was so grand that its only restriction was the disinterest in utilizing its full potential. Imagine what a man, hell-bent on conquering and controlling the West, could do with a soldier who held those capabilities. Cornwall was done with imagining. And Frank had discovered that not only was this now at the forefront of his priorities, but he'd already gotten started. He had already begun by casting a very wide net. Cases like Frank, the rabbit, the deer who killed Davy had far proved the potential of the animal kingdom's power. And while Frank was an outlier, far more formidable than any other, it wasn't going to deter Cornwall from attempting recreations. Some passengers on that train had been given a very specific duty, to scout the heartlands in groups and raid as many farms as possible. Nothing was off limits, and the kidnapping of this Emerald Ranch sheep family was no exception. Unfortunately, saving these sheep came with the price of having to fire a weapon twice. And while it's always a little disappointing to have to go against our guidelines even slightly, it was for the greater good. Who knows how brutal Cornwall's experiments could be. At least for now, the sheep would be safe in Valentine until they could be escorted back to Emerald. John insisted that he come along to help with this, and if that, along with the last few days, had proved anything, it's that his dedication to fighting for a better tomorrow was strong, unbreakable even. Frank and Arthur were beyond glad to have him on their side. He wasn't just an irreplaceable ally, but a friend too. So Western Jesus, Frank, and John got the Emerald Sheep out of harm's way and into safe hiding. While it was a good deed, the magnitude of the issue at hand continued growing. The group needed to pick up and leave as soon as possible. It was simply too dangerous to remain in the same spot any longer. Frank's intel was much too telling of the power that Cornwall and his movement held. To sit and to wait for him to make the first move would be nothing short of suicide. The boys stopped into the local saloon, exactly where they expected to find Dutch and Strauss, as their dedication to the war had been abysmal, to say the least. The resistance needed to leave now. Tensions were far too high for them to sit complacently any longer. If Cornwall were to ever discover their exact location, the repercussions would be catastrophic. <laughs> I've let you fools play your little game for far too long. 
Why I've let it continue for as long as it has is a little bit beyond me now. Maybe I enjoyed watching you struggle to keep up with your impossible endeavors, leaving you to your own devices has proved quite amusing. But this is no longer time for playing, Morgan. I admire your dedication, really, I do. But apparently my more indirect warnings haven't been clear enough. So allow me to show you with a little more clarity. Your impossible mission is just that. Go going forward, there will be no more choices, boy, no. Only consequences. Whatever remains of you afterwards will simply be a product of that fact. So tell me, why would I bother killing you here, where you stand, when I can instead break you to watch you crawl? Thank you.